Good afternoon. I'm Tamara Cook. I'm a program manager in the uh, COGS Department of Environment and Development. So thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Regional Property Assess Clean Energy, or PACE, Local Government Roundtable. We are excited to bring this um, meeting to you today and start, I don't want to say start, but re-engage on the dialogue of PACE in our region as part of a State Energy Conservation Office uh, contract that COG has to work on energy management activities. We are going to be working over the next 18 months at providing specific local government assistance uh, for PACE adoption in our region. So this is really the first event that we're hosting under that contract to continue to encourage our cities and counties to look at PACE as an opportunity. Um, and so that's what we're here today. And we want to really just leave this very casual and open to feedback and um, gaining information on where we are in the region currently with PACE as it's been several years since it was adopted by the legislature and really just have an understanding of um, over the next 18 months or so, what, are, what areas can COG offer um, in terms of services for our local governments to continue adoption of PACE in our region. So with that, I will um, move forward to the next slide, Al. Thank you. Um, so on today's agenda, uh, we unfortunately will not, with such a great group of um, participants today, we don't have time to go through everyone um, who's on the line. But as I said earlier, if you're just joining, please drop your name and your affiliation into the chat box. Uh, that helps us just know who's on the line. And um, we will be moving through a series of a few presentations. Um, the first presentation will be from Gavin Dillingham with the Houston Area Research Center. He will be covering kind of the nuts and bolts of PACE um, and, and how it's, uh, what it is and uh, current adoption status, those type of things um, in his presentation, just a general overview. And then we wanted to bring a couple of case studies to, uh, to hear about, uh, specifically, we're going to be hearing from Wayne Emerson from the city of Dallas and Lisa McMillan from Tarrant County on their past experiences with PACE, why they chose to initiate these programs in their communities, uh, and the benefits and the outcomes that they've had to date. And then we really want to um, provide some time on the agenda for discussion um, and questions from local governments that maybe have considered PACE but haven't move forward from, for one reason or another, um, answering any specific questions. And for full disclosure, we have um, asked our uh, providers in our region that offer PACE programs. Um, I have, we have offered uh, them to come on the line around 2.15 for that discussion so that they can serve as a technical resource to COG um, because they really are the experts in the program and, and how they are run. So that if there's any questions that pop up that we can't answer or that Gavin can't answer, um, they are there to, to provide um, some assistance, perhaps. Uh, and then just wrapping up at the end, how do we move forward? What services, again, can COG perhaps provide? We do have an element in our contract with um, FICO, uh, who is actually on the line today as well, participating in this roundtable, where we are trying to assist five cities per year. That's a lot, so 10 total. Um, over the next 18 months in adoption of PACE. So it's a pretty ambitious target, um, but we want to see where we can assist in moving the needle um, and bringing additional cities or counties uh, into the mix. And currently we've got nine communities. Uh, Sal, you can go to the next slide. I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Oh, nope. So we've got nine counties or nine cities and nine counties all together, um, nine entities, I should say, uh, that have currently adopted and and COG really is supporting this program um, and has been for years, but really refocusing our efforts in the region for a number of reasons, uh, including energy and water use, uh, reduction of those um, economic uh, benefits and economic development opportunities, which you will hear from Dallas and Tarrant County um, on those. And then also just in general, regional air quality uh, improvement and really looking at reducing the need for electrical generation, electricity generation um, from the get-go, because the more energy efficiency and water efficiency you can can install in buildings, 
um, the less uh, demand on the grid that there is. And I think we all can agree that the winter storm really highlighted that for all of us in terms of resilience and preparing for um, the future. And this is maybe one tool in the toolbox to, to consider. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we have nine entities in our region that have current PACE programs. This has grown since the original legislative action in Texas. Um, slowly, a couple every year, it seems, have, have been joining the program, uh, which is fantastic. But as you all know, we have 168 cities in our region, just in our 16 county region. So um, there's, and I know the counties kind of encapsulate many of those cities, especially Tarrant County, um, with 30 some odd cities that they represent. So um, definitely we've got a good showing in terms of the, the population that's covered in our region by a PACE program, but um, there's still, when you look at the regional view, there's still um, areas uh, that we would like to assist our communities um, in, in moving forward with potential PACE programs. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wayne and Lisa. They're both going to share their experiences as case studies uh, in North Texas and share with us um, their their PACE program experiences. And then we will, oh wait, actually we we're have having Gavin first. <laughs> I forgot. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Gavin first it's to do an overview. So um, hello everybody. Um, great to have an opportunity to speak with you on PACE. Thank you, Tamara and uh, Seiko for inviting me to come speak here and just continuing to push along uh, these uh, this financing opportunity across the state here. It's good to see uh, a wide variety of interest as well as understanding of this. So it looks like some of you could probably go through this presentation just as well as I can. So uh, please feel free to correct anything that I may say incorrectly here. Um, so just quickly going to cover what is PACE, Texas PACE history and the current status. Um, as Tamara mentioned, I'm with the Houston Advanced Research Center. We're a research institute up in the Woodlands, just north of Houston, working on a variety of air, water, and energy issues, as well as doing a lot more work now in the climate risk, uh, climate space there. So um, once again, and what I do actually at HARC is I lead the, uh, the clean energy team. So we focus a lot on um, developing tools, decision tools around uh, microgrids, do a lot more work on energy resilience, especially after winter storm URI has been a growing focus in that regard there. So starting off with uh, what is PACE? So as we all know, or everyone on the call, property assessed clean energy. And so really allows for this uh, long-term uh, energy efficiency, water conservation, distributed energy projects to come to fruition here. Uh, works across a variety of different spaces from commercial, industrial, multifamily. Um, it's all previous developed pro property, no greenfield development here. And it's all repaid by a voluntary property assessment over the useful life of the improvements there. So great, um, great program that's showing great promise over here. Most of the projects do, um, can range, you know, can can go up to up to 20 years. So we cannot exceed 20 years. Um, in that regard. And you know, one of the greater interests in that is there's no out of pocket cost to the property owner. So a lot of great benefits in that regard. Uh, some of the improvements that are allowed there are, are, are shown here. They have to be permanent improvements uh, fixed to the real property intended to increase, decrease water and energy consumption or demand and it has to be on the customer's side of the meter. Um, we do a lot of work with Department of Energy and so we have more and we actually run a technical assistance program with them for microgrids and combined heat and power. And that is something where we're getting a lot more people asking us, especially after winter storm URI, whether PACE can cover on-site generation such as CHP and microgrids and it can. Um, so it's great to have this tool available for, for everyone here. Um, let's see any other key items on this as many of you know this cannot be done on, on government properties such as school districts or local state or federal properties and it can't be done on greenfield properties so it has to be on existing uh, existing sites in that regard um, how does the pace program work um, this is where we're going to be covering a lot today it's the local government adopts the framework and then the program administrator handles the coordination of the project requirements and financing there's really three different steps 
uh, associated with creating a, a PACE region is the initiation, so kind of this concept socialization and recruitment of key program participants, the adoption by the local government, and then implementation, uh, the program creation and the administration of this. And all of this has been made available through the, through the PACE in a Box program, which I'll go into further here in a minute, but it has a lot of the templates, tools, resources needed um, that can really help you understand how to do this. And with North Central Texas COG actively involved, um, they're going to have a lot, you know, have all these resources as well to make it a very simple and straightforward uh, process for everyone. Um, how does PACE work? So it's really just a simple and effective program, allows property owners to really see an increase, an immediate uh, increase to net operating income and find investing and in efficiency, um, allows them to choose a private sector capital provider and request that the local government place a senior lien on that property for the low, for the total cost of that project. And what the owner does is uh, you know, commit to the local government that they will pay the Texas PACE assessment through different types of installments. Um, so you, it's, you know, it's not a business or a personal loan, it's a voluntary land secured assessment that is paid off over time. And as I said earlier, it cannot exceed over, over a 20 year period. And it most focus on energy and water savings. Um, and those, you know, uh, you know, must all pencil out there um, as they look at this assessment there. Um, so what does PACE do? Um, increases net operating income and lowers utility costs, increases building values, increases community value, creates local jobs, improves source, resource consumption and saves money. So really provides a lot of wins across the, across the community here. And it's done over a series of out to 20 years. Um, you know, typical projects have a pretty short term financing plus a long return on investment can be some cash flow issues associated with that. Um, PACE is really structured for a project to be cash flow positive from the beginning. And unlike a traditional construction loan, it does not require a down payment and is structured so savings outweigh the, outweigh the benefits there. Speaking of benefits, a lot of benefits across a variety of stakeholders here from property owners um, having an opportunity to really decrease utility bills, increase property value, um, overcome a lot of those investment barriers that people face as far as access to capital, um, allows contractors to find you know, additional projects, gives them more, more work to do, um, allows local communities to really see benefits in economic development and improving the building and construction stock. And you know, on the state level, especially when we talk about the ERCOT region, really help on the energy efficiency and demand management side of things, and really, which is really important um, to make sure that where we find, you know, what are the most cost benefit beneficial ways to reduce peak demand and reduce load over time? Because the state's econo economy continues to grow, its population continues to grow, so we need to, you know, find the most appropriate ways in order to lower lower that demand, or at least maintain that demand to be a manageable. Um, over time and such. Um, and once again, you know, one of the key areas that we've been really talking with folks a lot about is just that resilience benefit that they provide, um, especially when you look at not only energy efficiency, but that distributed energy, you know, that microgrid, that solar plus storage, that on-site power um, that can really support things there. Oh, so just to give you a little bit about the Texas PACE history, um, you know, Texas, Texas PACE was designed with Texas in mind to be really a flexible market-based format, providing low administrative costs and high levels of consumer protection. Uh, you know, we find, you know, in other PACE programs potentially around the, around the country, um, there, you know, the administrative cost can be a little um, cost prohibitive, prohibitive or just a little higher than they really need to be. So really making sure that there's a low administrative costs, that it's a uniform user-friendly, scalable, and sustainable type program out there. And, you know, really make it easy for people to understand, you know, especially the property owners, the project consultants, local governments, and to have that kind of single administration type model across the state, which is key, which really allows for that efficiency. So if you are a design consultant or an engineering company or a, a building owner, um, and you have multiple properties across the state, you're not guessing which administration, uh, kind of administration you're dealing with here. You're dealing with, the, you know, one specific type of administrative process. Um, just the Texas PACE history there. Um, we've been fortunate to be involved from the beginning here with the passage of the bill back in 2013, helping with the development of the PACE in the box. Um, you see that the first uh, program was in Travis County back in 2015, and it just continues to grow significantly to where there's been over $150 million invested across the state. So really nice growth happening in that regard and you know, just continues to, continues to develop 
Um, as you know, as as the pace in a box was being developed, you had the Keeping Pace in Texas folk really brought together a, a broad coalition of pace stakeholders, uh, the Texas Pace Coalition, as they were called, to really kind of come together and develop that toolkit for local governments uh, as they created pace um, there, and really provides a lot of templates that that are very important and really allows for that standardization uh, across across everywhere. There and it was really nice to kind of see this such, such a wide spread of folks involved with that. You had the more of your private sector folks, such as BOMA, involved to SECO, of course, the Texas Association of Business, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, the Texas Association of Regional Councils, uh, Public Financial Management Group. So you know, really a lot of wide diversity of interest involved in developing this this um, kind of uniform program across the across the state here. Just to give you a little more about Pace in a Box, it's really just a, a toolkit that's used to be uh, uniform, user-friendly, scalable, and sustainable across there. It gives you all of the key uh, steps you need to do to create that administrator, make sure that that administration is done in a way that's transparent and does not compete in the market. The competition really comes across the lenders and across the engineering companies and the uh, and and the and and the sellers there of the HVAC equipment or lighting equipment and such. The administration does not need to be competitive. It needs to be standard and um, and useful and low cost. And so you really get that competition that comes across the lenders there. And I think they've really done a nice job uh, to make sure that there's a wide diversity of folks that are willing to you know fund uh, fund these programs um, out there. And I guess we'll hear from them a little bit later today. Um, uniform standard means uniform data, just indicating that you know. Um, you know, making sure we have really good data. This is a site we put together at HARC that measures energy and emissions tracker. Um, Tamara showed a couple pictures earlier of this as well, but really allows us to see this growth over time and see uh, what cities and regions are, are doing across the space. Some of the current status there, there's about 36 states that have enabling legislation for PACE, so it continues to grow of interest. Um, most of these are all commercial PACE programs, not residential PACE. Um, in the state of Texas itself, there's 60% of the population is within a PACE region. The Texas PACE Authority has 57 of those regions, and there's a group called Lone Star PACE that has nine of those regions, but you see it's widely uh, being adopted across the state here. The U.S. PACE market, you can see it's pretty, pretty sizable. It's a $2 billion investment so far, about 2,500 projects, lots of jobs created in a variety of different projects from resilience to energy efficiency. Uh, for the Texas PACE market, so to date, uh, as of the writing of these slides, there were 45 projects, 150 million invested, a bunch of jobs created around that there as well. So Texas PACE market, you look at that graph, is really growing uh, fairly significantly, and it's exciting to see a growing interest of, um, of cities and counties continuing to look into ways in which they can use energy efficiency and, and improve the renewable energy, reduce emissions, um, improve resilience through through pace here. So thank you again for the opportunity to discuss and I'll be hanging around to answer questions later on. Thank you, Gavin. Um, I see, yes, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat box um, or unmute yourself and, and ask if you've got a question for Gavin. Um, Dewey has a question, glaring that Dallas County is not on the list. Has Dallas County expressed interest in pace? Um, so there's probably better experts on the line um, that can specifically answer the status of Dallas's Dallas County um, adoption of PACE, but I do know that it went to their commissioner's court in, Dal in, in December 2020. Is anyone from Dallas County on the line or does anybody, can anyone else speak to this? This is, this is Wayne. Um, they are looking, looking at Dallas County doing it, but <clears throat> there's kind of this interesting overlap um, that we're kind of working with them as well is, uh, you know, with Dallas being the largest city and the, you know, most, um, population in the county, how that's going to work between the, between the two. So I do know that they're looking at it and that I believe they have something, uh, going on in the next month or two. Um, I just heard Kevin, um, our assistant director kind of speaking about that, but there, there is some movement to, to adopt a PACE program. I see somebody with their hand up. Hang on, just, I'm not sure who it is though. Chris. Hey, no. Tamara. Yeah. Hey, thanks. thanks for calling on me. <clears throat> I guess the question would be in the last year, um, you know, with the pandemic issue that's been going on, for those that had a, a PACE program, how, how successful have they been in 
maintaining those, you know, those commitments and uh, how, how active has it been since since the pandemic has uh, been been in place? And, and this is probably I give credit Tamar to you and Edith for having this conversation as you know, everything looks back to be reopening and, and getting back on our feet that this is a good time to possibly allow folks, especially before a, a budget season, to be able to maybe take some consideration into these ideas and strategies. So I'm not sure if anyone that has a PACE program can can speak to that question about COVID potentially, but maybe maybe Dallas and Tarrant County can maybe touch on that in their, their remarks, Chris. Would that be okay? Or yeah. if anybody else wants to weigh in right now, please do. Thank you. A anecdotally, I've heard that um, th there's been a very strong pipeline coming through. Um, one, one of the things we do it's just kind of work on kind of looking through the the pipeline of projects and I'm getting I'm trying to get some numbers right now on it but from what I've seen so far pace had not really slowed down some of this effort at least in the last few months it seems to be going pretty well thank you Gavin okay any other questions for Gavin okay so um Gavin hopefully you can hang on the line in case we've got any other technical things that come up that we would need your assistance with, but we appreciate the introduction there. That was really good resources that um, HARC has available on their website to track the emissions and the actual um, impact of, of PACE in Texas. So really neat um, visual tools on their website. If you haven't checked those out before, I would highly recommend it. Okay, so now I'm back on the agenda officially. Uh, City of Dallas and Tarrant County will share their experiences, and I think Wayne, you are up first. So Wayne Emerson, who's the Economic Development District Manager um, for the City of Dallas, will will give us an update. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Okay, so okay, here's just kind of a brief rundown of um, the City of Dallas's history with the PACE program. So in 2013, we were an early advocate for the program and getting that uh, legislation passed. And then eventually we were participants in the Pace in the Box working group. And then ultimately we adopted the resolution in 2015 and we had a competitive procurement, uh, procurement process um, with the t ultimately selecting the Texas Pace Authority to be our TPA, our third party program administrator. And then um, we actually closed our first deal in 2017. That was the, uh, to this date, it's the largest PACE project in Texas. And I'm gonna speak uh, a little bit more about that in just a moment. And then in 2020, um, we adopted our comprehensive environmental and climate action plan. And we really identified PACE program as um, a big part of that to achieve goals one and two. Goal one being to increase energy efficiency in, in our existing buildings in the city. And then goal two to ensure uh, affordable access to renewable energy. And uh, I have another example that I'll, I'll speak about that as well. Um, but primarily when we adopted it, it was as a economic development tool. All right, so All right. the Butler, Butler Brothers building is um, uh, a building right building. next to City Hall. Uh, originally uh, built in 1910, it was a warehouse, the Butler Brothers warehouse. Um, the building was, uh, functionally vacant uh, throughout the 90s and, and the 2000s. And the owner of this Altera had looked for ways of redeveloping it, but the numbers just never made sense. If you if you kind of look at this chart, uh, when they went to a bank or they went to their investors, there was just a, uh, a financing gap that needed to be plugged with a mezzanine loan. And uh, the cost of that loan just, just did not make this project feasible. Um, so when Pace came in, um the property owner was able to make these needed improvements to to make this a financial um uh financially feasible project and and to get a much better uh rate on those loans and and you can see that uh the assessment total came in about 24 million the entire project was a 120 125 million dollar project and so we went from a vacant building you know right in the heart of downtown to this building, which now has two um, flag branded hotels. Uh, it's got ground floor retail and then about uh, 200 plus apartments. And they were able to use anything from HVAC, lighting, insulation, roofing, glazing, plumbing, irrigation, and then 
even the exterior, the envelope of this building was was PACE eligible. So going from the largest PACE project in Texas, this is our uh, this is the smallest PACE project uh, ever in Texas. So this is Dallas Paint and Body. Uh, this is a small uh, minority owned um, business in southern Dallas. And what they did here was they went and got some uh, solar panels uh, put on the roof and then had some LED lighting upgrades inside the garage and um, in the parking lot. And, you know, took a, some improvements that this owner uh, did not have the upfront capital to afford and immediately resulted in a 92% um, in electricity savings for that owner. And if you just want to move the last slide, I can kind of just show you all the projects we closed. And, um, you know, maybe I can help answer Chris's question from earlier. So this first project was in 2017, the Butler Brothers one. We have since, we just closed on our last project, Redbird Mall, that was last week. So we've completed six projects in total uh, for 42 million and, or basically 43 million in PACE financing, which um, I believe we're the largest uh, government entity in, in the state of Texas as well. And I can tell you that the Continental Gin that closed in 2020, uh, JW Marriott, that was three months ago, and Redbird Mall was just last week. And then we have, I know of at least one that we're pretty confident is going to close by the end of the month. And then even another uh, project behind that. So um, relatively speaking, we're seeing an, in, we're actually seeing an increase in projects due to COVID. But I guess the real question is you don't know how many we might have missed out on um, had had COVID not happened. And really um, what we're kind of seeing is that most of these projects, aside from that Dallas paint and body, they're the much larger projects. And um, on our end, we initially were, we're kind of surprised that it didn't scale out more to some of those mid-market um, projects, but hopefully, you know, maybe this could be COVID related, but we're hoping to see some some more scaling in those mid-market uh, projects. And that's about I have all I have on the city of Dallas side. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Wayne. Uh, Chris, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, Wayne, thanks for for um, you know circling back on my question. What my 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 new one, if you don't mind, and, and I apologize if I missed it, but you know, obviously this was you identified this was in your climate action plan. How has the city, you know, a uh, modif uh, modified its organization or staffing needs to be able to do this type of work? You know, is it like new staff, staff that was reallocated, staff that was already there, just from a, a staffing uh, support standpoint? Well, uh, it's a good question. So a little background on me. I'm actually the newest member uh, here in the Economic Development Office. And so um, this, I've kind of taken on this role. I just got, I just came to the city I guess three and a half months ago. And so this is, uh, I'm kind of taking this on. This is, you know, my main project now. Um, before my assistant director, uh, Kevin Spath, was kind of leading this up with another one of our colleagues, uh, Heather Lepeska. She's she's moved on to a different role. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the, the head, leading the head on this now. So I hope that answers your question. But yeah, this like you, you know, because there's a lot of investment that you're working towards and in working with. Is there like a good support team, or is it pretty like you were saying, pretty much you, or or do you have some additional staff to help you with this? It is so. A, a lot of this work goes to the third party administrator, so they they're kind of doing a lot of that work. What we're doing is we're kind of, you know, casting a big net trying to um, advocate for this program and getting it out there. And so what, you know, what we've been doing is working with housing, um, especially our um, property compliance folks who are, you know, kind of seeing these, especially apartment buildings that, you know, need improvement. So that's one area that we're kind of moving into. And I've had a few meetings with, with those owners as well, trying to, you know, tell them that, hey, this is an option that you've got to make these improvements. Here's a way for you to, to make some energy savings and, um, and there's just different ways that we're trying to get the word out. And I think it, it the one thing I'd say is that with um, property owners and property investors is they kind of have a model 
that they they lean on and they go to and so that's kind of been uh if there's been some friction it's kind of really you know trying to educate them on, on why this is a benefit and why that they need to you know take their old model and, and kind of throw something new in so that's that's probably to me been the biggest um challenge that i i've seen moving in here but as far as capacity goes i, I you know i have extra capacity I'm, I'm i'm ready to get some more projects you know in the pipeline great thank you okay and i think we'll take uh one more question and then we'll Lori, we may save your question for the discussion section so that we can go ahead and let um, Lisa present, but um, do we had a question for you, Wayne? Had the Trinity Groves development been envisioned now rather than back when the city of Dallas adopted PACE? Would a similar project qualify for PACE? Um, so once again, I'm new. I wasn't here at the time, but it's my understanding that Trinity Groves was a ground up development. Um, and well, no, I guess there was actually was a warehouse piece there. It, it, it could have actually, yeah, I suppose it could. Um, one thing, in, in fact, if we look at this graphic that JW Marriott building, I think we're looking at any and all things, is it that there was a building there. And one thing that's interesting about Pace is that you can almost kind of have like a complete tear down and then build that back up. And that's, that's considered um, eligible. But um, yeah, I guess I, I just can't really answer your question because I wasn't around back back in the Trinity Groves. So, okay, no problem. Okay, well, um, to keep keep things moving, we'll hold Lori's questions that I see in the chat, Lori, if that's okay, and let uh, Lisa cover hers, and then we'll we'll come back to those um, on jobs and um, kind of that community outreach perspective or contractor outreach perspective. Okay, so um, turning it over to Lisa McMillan, she's the assistant. County Administrator with Tarrant County, um, and they we wanted to have a city and a county, um, at least one city and one county present, so she's going to cover the county perspective. Lisa? Thanks, Tamara. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to go over the county's perspective and how we um, initiated our um, PACE program in Tarrant County. The next slide, please. So our program was actually established in November of 2017, but the work on this um, started more than a year prior to that. Actually, um, economic development staff here at the county was approached by the city of Fort Worth and the COG to consider establishing a PACE program because it would be countywide. And as Tamara mentioned earlier, she talked about a goal of five cities to uh, create PACE, but I told her when we spoke before that it'd be better to have that goal of being five counties because when you do a county, you get all of the cities underneath that county, and that's worked in Tarrant County. Tarrant County itself has uh, 41 municipalities that are all or a part in Tarrant County. Um, about 37 of those, I think, are pretty many, much wholly in Tarrant County. So even the city of Fort Worth um, can do programs within Tarrant County. Uh, those parts of outside of Tarrant County and Parker and Denton would fall under other programs. But really, it's easier because of the steps necessary if you could concentrate on getting the counties or another organization, another re regional organization to actually enact the program instead of piecemealing it. Um, what we like about the fact of it being countywide is that it's easier for our business owners and our lenders to understand the program because the everything's the same. They're using in Tarrant County the one single um, administrator that we had. The forms are the same. There's uniformity um, by doing it for a county standpoint, because as we all know that attorneys tend to change documents. So if you have multiple cities, then even though Pace in a Box tries to use the same forms, every city attorney wants to um, tweak those forms a little bit. So it's easier if you have it from a large um, organization establishing the program. So as we got started um, talking with our commissioner's court about establishing the PACE program, we got together with our county administration, county judge's office, our DA, our budget office, and our auditor and tax offices because we needed everybody to understand the program because it was new to us. And it took a while 
And over that year, we met um, with the Texas PACE Authority, and they described the PACE in a Box program to us. And that's when we moved forward with um, establishing the program at the end of set 2017. And then we chose our uh, program administrator, which is Texas PACE Authority. In the county's establishment of our um, PACE program, we actually required that our administrator be a nonprofit administrator. And uh, that way, there was um, under the PACE, Texas PACE Authority, we have found that the property owner is able to choose the lenders that they want. Um, Texas Pace Authority can provide suggestions if needed, but um, it is up to them to choose who they need to and bring other people into the program, and they're not required to use any specific lenders or services um, under that program. And then they are paid a 1% fee by the owner when they get that loan. So we chose Texas PACE Authority, and since that time, we actually have had eight local PACE projects since 2019. We didn't have um, anything starting in um, 2018. Uh, it was a little bit slow to get off the ground, but in 2019, we had several projects. And then in 2020, um, even with COVID, we've had several additional projects come online. And to date, we've had over 24 million in uh, PACE investment in Tarrant County and more than 305 jobs created. And our resulting energy savings annually, we show from these projects to be over 10 million gallons of water, 6 million kilowatt hours of electricity, more than 20 million BTUs of natural gas saved, and 4,150 tons of CO2 avoided in our area. So the benefits of the PACE program to Tarrant County was um, mainly we added this to our economic development toolbox. But as we all know, quality of life and environmental factors are part of economic development. So it is environmental in nature, too. For the county, we see increased property values when um, a building owner is able to uh, assist in renovations through the use of PACE financing, provides additional job opportunities um, for the re renovated businesses and the contractors who do the work. There's reduced electrical demand and water usage, and then increased business retention and expansion by making these older um, buildings, our older building stock, um, ready to be used and uh, mo uh, modernized going forward. And for our property owners, as Gavin mentioned earlier, up to 100% financing, low upfront costs, and generally, um, as per the program, the savings from the energy improvements are expected to exceed the annual loan payments. So the, the uh, program itself should pay for the loan payment. And the PACE assessments are tied to the property. So the owner is only responsible only during the property ownership. So once that property is sold, the assessment or the loan goes with the property. And for lenders, it's a low-risk loan. The assessment um, lien gets the same priority as a tax lien. And the existing mortgage holder must approve if there is a mortgage on that facility. So in Tarrant County, some of the projects that um, we have had um, the historic ISIS theater in Fort Worth, um, it's a nonprofit theater. As you can see, the assessment's approximately $2.3 million, and they've done a variety of improvements with HVAC lighting and water. And that project um, is, while relatively small, is bringing life that's in the stockyards to an area of town where there's a lot of other activities going on. Another project that's a small nonprofit is um, the ACH Child and Family Services Home, just a little over half a million dollars in um, the project. Um, HVAC, lighting, insulation, a variety of items also on this project. So moving on to some larger projects that we did, the Hilton Garden Inn in Grapevine um, is a hospitality hotel project, a little over $6.6 .6 million um, assessment on that project, again for lighting, HVAC, plumbing, and a building envelope. And then we had the Kempton Hotel, which is one of our larger projects also. Um, this is a historic hotel down in um, Fort Worth, downtown. It's um, on 
office building that was previously used by XTO Energy, and it's being renovated um, to a hotel, a Kempton Hotel. A little over 5.8 million was for the PACE loan itself, but in the capital stack on this project, there is a variety of um, tools that are being used, including federal and state tax credits, um, historic exemption from the city and county. The city is also doing a 380 economic development agreement, and the downtown tax increment financing district also is providing funds. So, um, as with a lot of projects and some that Wayne showed earlier, the PACE financing is just one tool that can be added to make a project work, especially some of the larger projects. Um, the next island, um, this is one of the newer um, projects we have, the Sterling Building, and it's up in Northeast Fort Worth, and it's an older office building that is being renovated with new HVAC and lighting and just under um, 500000 on that project. The Sinclair Hotel is another new project for 2020, and it too is in downtown Fort Worth, and it um, is being renovated for a hotel also. Um, this is a little bit over $8.2 million, and they're doing also a variety of lighting, HVAC plumbing, and building envelope. Two other smaller projects that we have that are new also for 2020 um, is a new birth missionary Baptist church in South Fort Worth, um, nonprofit. Um, assessments is only 152,000. So we go from 8.2 million to 152,000, and they're simply doing solar. And then we have another um, office, multi tenant office building in the city of Bedford, and that um, assessment is just under $500,000 too. A lot of our projects run the gamut um, from larger to very small projects. We have not done a multifamily project yet, um, but we anticipate that we'll have a lot more projects in the future. Um, we actually have found that since COVID in 2020, um, there were more projects than we had in 2019. So we had we don't see the pace of pace slowing down. Uh, we think it's only getting um, better. I've had a lot of inquiries. Um, as Wayne mentioned earlier, from the county's perspective and as far as what staff has to do, um, most of our work is done just getting the word out about the program, uh, working to have our chambers get information out to their property owners and building owners, and just letting it, the general um, public and the vendors know that this is something that's available. All of the work in terms of getting the project together, doing all the engineering studies, everything that um, is in involved in the back end of getting the loan secured is done by our PACE administrator. So that isn't really done in-house. Um, we get a report um, each time that uh, a project comes to fruition and is closed. And then our PACE administrator provides an annual report to the county and then also provides the um, assessment notices that go into the tax bills that we send to those property owners also. So that is pretty much um, what the PACE administrator does. So really it takes a lot of the um, work off of the uh, county staff or the city staff and uh, to have a good administrator, they will do most of that work and you just sell the program. So otherwise, I guess that's all I have. And as I mentioned in my slide, the future is bright and energy efficient. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Yes, I like that last slide. That's great. Um, you have a very diverse portfolio of projects all around the county, so that's great representation too. They're not just in Fort Worth, so that's great. Um, any questions for Lisa? I'm seeing that Wayne commented to Lori, so thank you, Wayne, for answering Lori's questions in the chat. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Wayne, uh, and thank you, Gavin. I think we'll move on to the discussion time. Uh, this is a very open discussion time for our communities and our counties that may be on the phone that are curious about PACE, have looked into it, um, that maybe there's something uh, that's scary about it or um, that's a barrier to adoption or moving forward. Um, really, this is just an open discussion time to really talk about um, what challenges there might be, what opportunities there might be, where cities and or counties in our region could use assistance to um, perhaps um, 
consider adopting PACE over the next however long that it would take. Lisa mentioned it took them quite a while to get their program um, up and running. Um, so really this is open discussion time and feel free to use the chat box too. I know, oh good, we're getting some questions coming in. So Brian Haywood, um, has anyone experienced an approved deal gone bad? And how does one deal with that assessment lien process? To date, I'll address Tarrant County. We have not um, had a deal gone bad yet. Um, so I don't anticipate, you know, really, I think across the state and in most other states, generally, um, you don't see a lot of default. Obviously, the payments are still made to the bank, so the bank is themselves are going to be doing what they can on the front end to make sure that those payments are made. And it only comes down to a default or foreclosure after a lot of work, I think. So um, we haven't had any experience with that. But again, our program is new and we've only had um, loans that are only in a short time period right now. Wayne, can you weigh in maybe on that too? Yeah, I'm going to just echo what Lisa said is that, you know, <clears throat> there's it's such a new program that we have we haven't seen any deals go, you know, gone awry. And um, certainly yeah, a lot of that is being, you know, the lenders when they're underwriting this, they're kind of doing that underwriting to make sure that it is going to be a financially feasible project. OK, and Gavin, I see your hand up. Do you want to weigh in, too? Yeah. Um there there haven't been any that have gone south in, in Texas yet, and if there's any across the nation, it's been very few. And I think the piece with, the, um, with how it's set up in Texas with two independent third-party review processes happening really ensures that the, the program is set up in a way that um, the, the savings will be, you know, are going to be realized. And so that third-party review happens not only you know, after the investment grade audit is done prior to the work beginning, but also after the work is done to ensure everything's been done appropriately. And so I think that provides some, you know, a couple major safeguards in there that is really allowed for the, uh, the state to have just really solid projects come to fruition and go forward. Okay, and we've got a question from John Thatcher. Pace loans provide financing for redevelopment. What about situations where the land is currently vacant and the development world wants to use it for new construction? Um, I'll address this, but Gavin may be able to follow up. Um, there has to have been a, a building on that site previously. Uh, we, I think they've, they've determined they might be able to make it work if there was something on there previously and it was demolished, but it can't have been um, a totally greenfield without any facility on it in the past to be able to use PACE. Yeah, that's that is how it should work. Uh, no greenfield, but if you've had a brownfield that can be redeveloped, that's fine. it has to be previously developed at one point. Okay, and John's follow-up question is how far back does that go? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure how far back that goes. I don't know if there's anyone on the line that might know the answer to that, but if you do, please please feel free to chime in or put it in the chat. <laughs> hey, Tamara, this is Dub Taylor, uh, Hi, Dub. Texas Space Authority. Yeah, I can add a little bit to that. I think what we look at uh, in qualifying a property is if there is some historic record that shows that that lot was developed at one point. It's very likely that if it had an old structure that's been cleared, that it appears to be vacant, uh, but uh, there may be historical records through the appraisal district. There may be historical photos. There may be some other evidence to support the fact that the lot was developed and, and is eligible for PACE. Okay, thank you, Deb, for that follow-up. Okay, and then we had a question from Dewey. Um, if lack of awareness may be the issue, uh, are PACE adopters sharing outreach material to COG? Um, so I think he's referencing a, a conversation that was uh, in Lori's questions about, well, specifically Dallas mentioned that they've only had one small project, that most of their projects have been very large. Um, so if kind of that lack of awareness from smaller owners are they sharing with COG and just watch Texas Pace's YouTube video? There's a great info cartoon apparently, so that's great, Dewey. Um, so I can take a stab with um, answering the, the first question and any of my other fellow COG colleagues, please feel free to weigh in. Um, we 
have not recently been sharing a whole lot of information on PACE. Uh, I think you will see that changing. Um, this is really, as I mentioned at the top of this roundtable, um, our, our next phase of trying to encourage our cities and counties in our region to consider this program as an opportunity um, because there are such great benefits happening in our region already. Um, so in terms of the current adopters in our region sharing material with us, that, that has not been an established relationship that we've had, but I think going forward, um, we would love to change that and help share messaging if and when we can. We've got so many newsletters that go out on a regular basis. Um, we already share uh, announcements with our, our members uh, on opportunities that are coming up related to PACE that they may be interested in that are sponsored by other organizations or conferences or whatever it is. Um, so I think there's certainly room for um, involving more of that one-on-one -on -one relationship with those that have already adopted PACE in our region. So Tamara, to follow up on that, um, I know that in February we did a, um, a program with the Fort Worth Chamber and they reached out to BOMA and the Greater Real Estate Council. So we are trying to make inroads in those areas so that we can get the word out more to the um, participants in the market, not, not so much just about um, to the other entities. I mean, there's two different forums. Right. It's the other entities that need to know about it, but then also once you get it adopted, you need the users. So those are some avenues that I think the chambers themselves would um, be a great benefit to put on some um, video programs. We, as you notice, that we don't have any projects in the city of Arlington, so that's kind of our goal in Tarrant County, and I know I've been working with their economic development staff and their chamber to um, look at what we can do to help out um, get some of the programs started in the city of Arlington through those mm -hmm. channels. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point, Lisa, that really, you know, to, to get the participants in the program um, is really the owner. So I think those chambers and those organizations, BOMA, are great, great partners in that initiative. That's great. Um, okay, thanks, Dewey, for your, or Katie, for your comment on, on contacting Allison at Farmers Branch. Um, okay, Pritt. Um, Pritt works in our economic development team at COG. Uh, what have been the major challenges on getting businesses on board to use PACE? That's a great question. So I'll go ahead and take it on this side. So I've spoken to uh, a couple of um, folks that were kind of um, uh, forwarded to us from our small business folks. And one of the challenges we've kind of seen is we've seen some interest from small businesses, but a lot of those uh, small businesses lease and they don't actually own their space, even though they may they may be responsible for those improvements, but um, you know they you have to own the property, and then it's kind of getting the landlord on board as well. So you kind of have that you got to have um, all parties on board. So that was one challenge we face. And then, like I said, I think I kind of mentioned it earlier. Um, I don't have any you know no one said this to me, but I kind of have my intuition that with some of the other uh, property owners, they kind of have a model it's tried and true for them it, it works and it's just it's just kind of hard to kind of interrupt that and, you know they're very risk adverse and when you introduce something new to them um to them it's you know they've, they've got a model that works and they're, they're usually kind of sticking to it so once again i think it's just about getting you know educating and really getting the word out the, the benefits it's just kind of a slow process but i think as a region kind of takes off and they start you know hearing about it more and, and seeing more deals that um, the momentum will pick up more on it um, I'm going to follow up on that. Um, what Wayne said is true about some of the small business owners, but I also think too that um, with Dallas having more projects, with Tarrant County having more projects, having a variety of types of projects and sizes of projects, um, it helps to be able to point to a project and um, when you're talking to a business owner about this type of financing because I think that's why we were slow in getting started and we didn't have anything until 2019. People just didn't understand and now it's a lot easier um, to sell that information to somebody because they've got something to look at and then another owner they can call and they can talk to them about it. So I, I, I think as you get more projects um, that just kind of gets the ball rolling. Okay. Great, thank you, Wayne and Lisa. And yes, um, I see Edith's comment 
Um, if there are any other PACE adoptees on the line that you would like to share your experience, please please feel free to chime in here. This is an open discussion and we this is really meant for everyone to participate. Um, so City of Denton, I don't, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> Edith already called you out. Um, if, if you guys are on the phone and want to weigh in, if you've got anything to share, please, please feel free to do so. I haven't looked at the whole list yet. I'm trying to monitor the chat and the participant list, and it's a little bit challenging. So um, this is JT. Um, so I'm on from Denton, and I know um, I'll be updating Catherine a little bit more later, too. Um, so I know that Denton County is the, the main contact for this, and I think that we'll probably just be looking to learn more and looking um, to partner a little bit more at the county level. Um, and I know that that's been the um, sort of the overwhelming consensus for um, for Denton County, um, similar to uh, similar to Tarrant County in the uh, opinions of that. And so but that being said, we can definitely do more as a city to um, sort of move that process along. And so I think we'll be looking to do that. Uh, that's a that's a good point, JT, that you bring up. So Lisa, in Tarrant County, do the cities provide does do the cities individually provide like Fort Worth provide information to their specific chambers and their business owners, or really is that role falling on just the county primarily? It started just the county primarily and the um administrator um, was the one who was doing the training and all of the context and education um, but the cities recently um, we've been again we've been putting on a lot of these programs um, over the last year and so our cities are finding out more about it and i know the city of fort worth is actually actively um, getting word out now too so i think it's it's again something that just kind of takes time to get going but um, as as more and more projects are out there, um, people become more aware and the cities are now actually um, advocating for that as a tool in their toolbox also. Do we uh, do we ask COG has helped several entities adopt PACE program? Did any of those entities have major challenges in the adoption? Political support or ordinances, I think is a question. <laughs> um, I, Edith, you're going to have to help me out on this one. To my knowledge, I know that our leadership visited with Tarrant County, as Lisa talked about in the past, um, to see about their interest. Have we specifically met or assisted other Not counties? that I'm aware of. I was there for okay. the visit with Tarrant County, and, and it was, at that point, it was a, a newly emerging um option for our communities so we had several communities encouraging us you know plano and dallas and and denton and others that were encouraging fort worth encouraging us to you know reach out we weren't sure yet whether it was you know best to do this at a county level or a regional level um and so we wanted to check with our counties and see you know if there was interest but we were invited by tarrant county to come and speak with with you all about the pace program and what we knew and and i don't think we had at the point in time any ordinances to share and we were really meeting with the political officials um to try to encourage this so um, political support was was well they were the folks that we were meeting with so the judge so, so um it was a good experience, you know, but with the program being so new at the time, um, a bit of a challenge to really kind of grasp all the different components of that. Since then, I haven't, and I'm not aware of, of, of anyone meeting with a different community specifically about adopting PACE. I, I believe I would be aware of that if that had happened within our agency. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for helping me out on that one. Our Yarkus, Oh, OK, well, first, sorry, I'm missing some chats here. Deb said that Deb Taylor is with the Texas Pace Authority. He says Pace has a lot of moving parts, so having projects and case studies helps owners better understand. So I think that's going back to Lisa's um, remark on that. Um, and then Yarkis uh, asks, how did the attorneys for both entities approach the lien enforcement duty? I hope we don't ever have to do that. <laughs> 
But um, in terms of the county, the district attorney's office, our tax office, I think we all felt that um, if it ever is to happen, it's just going to handle like a typical foreclosure. So um, that's something that would we will have to really work on when that happens. But um, I think we all felt pretty confident that that would probably not happen very often, hopefully never. So um, obviously our district attorney was heavily involved in making sure that this is something we could do and they did not have any issues with the program. And as it's written in the statutes and the authorities that the county has um, in terms of foreclosure, if this were to ever go south. Yeah, and um, from my understanding of it, as I was kind of learning about the program, the idea is that if there is a, a default or if the property owner misses a payment, then basically the uh, the lender, the PACE lender, has to send uh, two 30-day late notices to the senior lien holder. So that would be the uh, whoever has a senior lien on the property. And so that kind of, you know, there's a backstop there as well as that uh, senior lien holder doesn't want to see the project going to the property going to default because then they're going to lose their property as well so there's kind of a backstop placed in there as well um but that was one kind of layer that kind of of extra layer of protection that's probably why you probably haven't seen as many defaults as well okay um i think i'm all caught up on questions did we get to Lori's? i know there was one on jobs that she had asked can you speak to the nature of the job creation or types of jobs and are they permanent positions? Does anybody want to follow up on that one? Yeah, so I think that was, <clears throat> I kind of put her back in the chat, but uh, the chart we kind of showed had job creation and, and those are uh, construction jobs that we track um, for our PACE program. But certainly there's going to be, you know, permanent jobs created uh, just in any any one of those entities. But as far as, far as our tracking for the PACE program, those are going to be primarily uh, construction jobs. Okay, great. Thanks, Wayne. Okay, and I'm catching up here. Lisa, um, has COG considered a regional PACE program similar to the Alamo Area Council? Um, so, well, that's a great segue. Um, so I was going to come back to this third question that's on the screen here for those cities or counties that may be on the line that could potentially use or desire some assistance um, taking a closer look at PACE. Um, and considering adopting PACE over the next um, however long, really. Um, COG, is, COG is able to assist. As I mentioned at the top of the discussion, we do have some dollars um, through a contract with the State Energy Conservation Office to assist um, either cities or counties or both um, with adoption of PACE. And so it really is trying to encourage um, local governments to consider this program. Um, and of course, Lisa, you made a very good point that counties really are, you know, the the key approach. Um, but certainly, that doesn't prohibit any city from um, participating as well. And we would certainly not discourage any community or city in our region from pursuing this further. Um, so, if there's any specific assistance that COG can can offer, we would like to know that. But then also, um, we were prepared to to talk about um, the potential, I'll say, the possibility of a regional PACE program. Um, the Alamo Area Council, I want to say it's been about a year, a little over a year since they officially adopted a regional program on behalf of their entire COG footprint, their, their Council of Governments um, footprint, um, which in our case would be 16 counties uh, or any subsection, I guess, of those counties. Um, that could be a different way of doing it as well, I guess. Um, and so we we're prepared to to talk about that um, today, if that's of interest to the group on the line to to hear, you know, the thoughts on that concept um, and what that might mean moving forward uh, in our region. Um, so I will I'm going to actually uh, get Edith to come back on screen here with me. Um, we've been collaborating on on this together to prepare. Um, and would love to hear thoughts from the audience and the the membership on the line, um, if that's something that that you all would support, perhaps. Um, several years ago, when PACE was adopted at the legislature, or um, and and this was really kind of a big thing at the time and really new, 
Um, I just don't think we were at the spot or the time to really know what does this all mean. There were a lot of questions and a lot of question marks um, in terms of funding and how we would support it and staffing and all of that. But things have advanced a long ways and, and there are some models now at other COGS that seem to make a whole lot of sense. So um, I think we're in a much better position to have those conversations now than we have been in the past. Um, so we do have a slide, uh, Sal, I don't know if it's the next one or not. Oh, I already asked that one, so I'm skipping ahead. Next steps. And so I'm just gonna, for full disclosure, I prepared this a few months ago. Um, so I hope that it's still um, current uh, for the most part, but this is kind of a conceptual um, program uh, at a regional level. Um, I have talked to several of our current PACE adoptees in our region over the past few weeks and got some really good feedback from them um, on their, their thoughts in terms of how they've done their own programs. So, you know, there's some minutia that we would need to, to go through and certainly lots of, of um, discussion uh, moving forward. But certainly um, there is a concept that, that we could mirror, we think, the Alamo area COG where COG would be a authorized representative and then um, contract, like Tarrant County talked about in Dallas County, with a third party administrator um, to uh, represent the communities in our region that aren't already um, represented by a program, or it could just be region wide. We don't know, we haven't figured all those details out yet. Um, but this is really, uh, I don't want to read all of this, um, but I think Gavin kind of quickly stepped through the general way that a program is adopted. So it really does mirror the same process um, that all of the other current adoptees have done. It's just the, the footprint or the geography that the program would cover is a larger scale than just a city boundary or one county boundary. It would be a larger cog boundary. Um, I don't, I'm gonna pause there. Edith, do you wanna add anything to that? Sure, Tamara, thank you so much. Um, so what we wanted to demonstrate to you all today was, you know, we've, we've put some real thought into the how. How would we do this if that step one is critical? If our communities are interested in a 16 county regional PACE offering. So back in, in the 2013-2014 timeframe when we were first visiting this, as I mentioned, we had several of our cities, you know, four or five of our cities that were really encouraging us to consider setting up a, a regional PACE program. At the time, there was some, some still unknowns about, you know, the funding and the liens and the third party administrator. And was that what we were supposed to do or were we, were we supposed to administer a program similar to the way that we administer other of our programs. Um, and so we've come a long way since then, I would say, you know, just in, in the evolution of PACE and all the efforts that have been put in and you see all the projects and everything. So, so it's almost like, well, are now we behind the times? I can't really tell. Before it seemed like we were too far in advance of it. And now it seems like, well, we're kind of catching up. And so somewhere in the middle, you know, we were still present and, and learning, but but we have not had any of our um, city officials, I would say, come to COG and request that we set up a regional 16 countywide program. And so we're still, as always, with any of our activities at COG, you know, we respond to regional planning and needs that are um, expressed by our member governments. And so we wait to hear, you know, we talk with our communities about options and opportunities and we try to educate and inform, um, but we really do wait to hear from our members about what what is wanted out there. And so I'll draw a quick, a very quick parallel. You know, we have a water quality strong program at our, at our council of governments. And at one point, not so long ago, uh, 2014 even, we had one watershed protection plan in our region and it was in, up in Denton for the like, Hickory Creek and, and they were doing a great job and, and running this watershed protection program. And we came to our water resources council with our utility providers and said, hey, we could, we could evaluate the region and figure out, get some funding options going for these water quality improvements. And what we heard back pretty quick 
Um, we applied for one. We, we went through North Texas Municipal and they were a strong supporter. And in the end, our communities within that area said, you know, we're, we're maybe not maybe not so excited about this. And so we never ever force our communities into any programs that they're not excited about that. And so we stepped back from that and, and came back to the Water Resources Council. And before long, there were seven additional watershed protection plans in our region. And when I say before long, it was within a year or two. And so it was remarkable how quickly our utility providers embraced the idea, sought out the funding, you know, and, and moved forward and they were doing it. And so now you look at the map of our region and we've got these all these watershed protection plans and the feedback I got from our utility folks was sometimes we want you to just point us in the right direction and inspire us and let us take it from there. So we don't always want you to do things for us. We just sometimes we just want to know collectively what you think we should be focusing on or thinking about. And so that has been, you know, a sterling example of how our regional partners can step up and take on a program and and you know, really just with our assistance and collaboration. So now we bring all those all those parties together and we talk about similarities and lessons learned in those watershed protection plans and how to go forward. Um, and so so we're we're there at this point. You know, we we have similar programs at COG. We have a, a, a water monitoring program that's very similar in um, process and procedure to the PACE program, we can do this. Um, but we really need to hear back from our communities before we just jump in and say, this is what you need. We, we, we never do that, that's a mistake. Um, we always wait to hear what our, what our communities need. And so um, we're really looking forward to that step one. You know, do, you, do you want this from us? Do you feel like you've already got it covered? Do you feel like you would do better at this as you know member governments within our 16 county or do you want us to consider taking this on and if you do you know we really need to hear from you uh, from your your leadership in your communities that you would like for a cog to you know step forward and, and produce a program and unfortunately at this point we've already got the aa cog example and so we've got a model to follow we've got sample coordinates we've got all this information and resources and if it's a want from our communities we're happy to fulfill that want but if it's something where you guys feel like you know you've already got this or you'd rather have it on a county by county level with our support to bring you together and talk about you know pace and and how you can improve improve on the program or how you can share knowledge to build your programs to be stronger you know we're happy to go either way and so, or somewhere in between, um, and we're prepared to, but we really do need that 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 step one. <laughs> you know, what what would you guys like? And so, this is a great roundtable for us. You know, we're hearing about about our individual cities' programs and their successes, and their processes and their projects. Um, and I think that's the best source of information for the peer cities and counties on the line right now. Is, you know, what are other folks doing that are that are our equivalents? And so um, to answer, you know, the question, have we considered it? We have, and here's what we've got. And so we're really at the point now of um, what can we do? What would you like us to do? So with that, I'll stop. Tamara, thank you for letting me um, talk for just a minute and we'll see what our members have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Enid. Any thoughts on this? Thank you, Lisa, for asking the question. So it sounds like there's some good things happening in Erath County related to PACE. So that's exciting, Jeff. Thank you for sharing that. Any thoughts from the participants on kind of this concept of a regional program? Tamara, this is Lisa again. I just want to say that um, whether or not the COG decides to enact um, an overall regional program. I think that by doing these programs that you're doing and lending support to the counties and cities that may want to authorize their own program is going to help because I think that's the education part and educating your um, elected officials 
and um, your finance and your um, attorneys, that's the, the biggest part. So I think if you get a constant message out and it's as these other entities have uh, now gone through that program and you can see our documents, I think that will help. Um, I do think that a, a regional approach um, would help some of the smaller communities that really don't have the time or effort or um, maybe, well, you know, politi politics goes both ways. Um, people don't understand and, what, and a lot of times they don't want to vote for what they don't understand. So sometimes just being able to have that program available um, is, is worth it when it's already done by an overarching entity. So I think either way that COG's going to provide support that will help um, all of our communities in the region. Okay, great. That's great. Great thoughts, Lisa. Thank you. Um, Alfonso Campos, I see your hand up. Yeah, just uh, in Erath County also, one of the first places I wanted to, to reach out to was the COG. And so thank you, Edith, for expressing that. Uh, you know, if, if we're not real familiar with some of the some of the issues that are coming up, uh, the COG is the natural place uh, for me to look to, to my counterparts or to the experts that they have on staff. So definitely my only concern would be if uh, is that a. Uh, are we getting two entities that would uh, compete against one another for 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 the the program that we're trying to get? And I'm not clear on that, but uh, I'll see what uh, feedback I can get on that down the road. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Alfonso. So, so my understanding is from your chat, or maybe from Jeff's chat, that ERAF is moving forward with a PACE program. Is that correct already? I'm just trying to clarify it's, for myself. We're get, we're, it's under consideration. I mean, okay. we, we've had a presentation and that's, I just want to be sure if, if uh, I mean, do we, how do we handle the COG uh, developing a program or if we go forward with ours, you know, th that, that was my remark about, uh, you know, two competing entities, you know, for, for a county or for a city uh, PACE program. So, so Judge Compost, let me just respond real quick, if that's okay with you. Um, we don't, we don't ever at Cog, we don't ever want to com compete with our member governments. And so, um, like for example, you know, Tarrant County, we would never set up a pro program that they would not like us to set up in competition. And so, that that would be a discussion that we would have with any of our counties and cities before we set up a program. Um, so that we could appropriately kind of outline the area so that it, it didn't create competition um, to speak of for our counties that wanted to have their own program. So, so like, for example, with stormwater monitoring, it's a requirement of TCEQ. And so we have phase one cities that are required to monitor their stormwater, uh, wet weather flows and report those annually and, and quarterly to TCEQ. Some of our communities want to participate in a regional program, so we host that and allow those participants. Others don't want to participate, and so they do their own stormwater monitoring when they want to. And so it would be similar to that, where we would work with our, you know, once we hear back from member governments that they do want us to set up a regional program, if that is the case, then we would start working with the, the, the counties and the cities that already have a program to make sure that we're not interfering with their um, their operations and their preferred um, means of business. So hopefully that helps you, um, you know, please make your decision. You know, if, if you guys um, would like a county program, we will be fully supportive and as helpful as we can be for you to do so, um, just as we are for, for Karen and, and if Dallas ends up you know, Dallas County ends up setting up a program, uh, we will definitely uh, be communicating with you to make sure we're not stepping on any toes. So thank you so much for being here and for participating today. Thank you, Edith, for that. Yes, um, and, and Judge Campos, we did have some, I've had a conversation with the city of Dallas about some of the same kind of boundary um, challenges perhaps and working through those if this is something that we're going to going to move forward with based on interest working through those um, so that there isn't added confusion from owners on which program do I go to and who's kind of the the main main entity to work with <clears throat> 
Okay, so I'm trying to respond to some of the questions because I know we've got one minute technically. Um, is there any last, let me see, I think, does anyone else have their hands up? And then I can finish trying to chat. So I'm trying to get to the questions. If, if we don't get to all of them, I will try to continue to um, answer some of them, Dewey, about the really quickly on the the costs. My understanding, at least for the, co the AA COG model, um, in San Antonio is that the staff time or the overhead costs, I think that's maybe what you're referring to, is covered by ne the negotiated fees with the third party administrator. So the COG negotiates those fees um, that the third party administrator is um, through the loans that they're coordinating uh, for the business owners. And so that's that's my general knowledge of it. Um, like I said before, there's still some details that we would need to learn more about. Um, but that's my general understanding is that uh, those there's a fee that would be passed on to the COG to cover their outreach expenses um, as part of part of the um, procurement effort that would be and the contracting effort that would be ne negotiated between the COG and the third party administrator. Yes, Darkus, um, my understanding also on the AA COG model. Um, that it is an opt-in model for local governments. As Ida said before, you know, everything we do is voluntary. Um, so if if there were a regional program for those areas in our region that would like to pursue that, it would be an opt-in program for those cities within that area uh, that they would be eligible to opt into through an interlocal agreement with the Council of Governments, but certainly not mandatory. Hopefully I answered those questions. I, I think that was all of them. I appreciate everybody's time. I know we're one minute over. Um, I, I really appreciate all the questions that we had. We will definitely probably schedule something in the future just as a kind of an update on pace from a regional perspective, just to keep momentum moving on this topic. And um, if you would like to reach out to anyone uh, on our team, Sal, I think the last slide is our contact slide. We will be posting these presentations as well. And, and as Ida said, um, in terms of the regional program, the, the number one step, the first step is, is there interest from our regional entities, our member governments in, in moving forward with that? And if you would like to contact Edith or myself directly and we can meet with you, we can meet with your leadership, um, uh, to, to advance those discussions, please let us know how we can assist you. Edith, anything else that you want to add before we close? I did not. I think this was a great discussion. And again, thank you to all of our participants for, for vocalizing your thoughts and sharing your questions with us and participating um, in a true kind of roundtable for that. And we will wait to hear back from you, I think, at this point, just to see you know, if we have interest out there and, and if so, we're happy to embrace that. So thank you all. And thank you, Tamara. You did a great job here. So okay. and Sal, I know you guys worked on it. So thank you yes. so much. OK, thank you. We'll we'll get the presentations posted so that everyone can see them. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to follow up. We really appreciate everyone and our presenters today. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye.